This week, a lecture about the New Deal community of Norvelt, located in southwestern Pennsylvania. With 250 homes, Norvelt provided housing, work, and a community environment to unemployed workers and their families during the Great Depression. It was renamed Norvelt in 1937 in honor of First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt and her interest in the project. One one of the goals was to allow uh, stranded industrial workers, people who were doing mining, not farming, out away from the cities to stay in in the hinterland because uh, the, the only places at this point that were really helping providing unemployment relief and food were the cities. So you would go to the city... Uh, the city would try and feed uh, folks who were unemployed within the city and who were struggling. We didn't have a national program yet. We didn't have statewide programs. More with St. Vincent College professor Timothy Kelly in a moment. Today's reading would have been on the Great Depression. Families face the Great Depression. So it would be appropriate for us to talk about uh, the story of Norvelt, which is, an, which is a Great Depression story, about how to deal with the suffering that the Great Depression brought about. And I want to first tell, talk a little bit about that suffering. So we can see that uh, economic ap- opportunity fell pretty dramatically. And this is a measure of uh, U.S. gross domestic product. So does anybody know what that might mean? Gross domestic product? Have a sense, Dan? That uh, would be products in the U.S. in general, not imports or exports, just products in the U.S. And not just physical products, but all economic activity. All so it's, it's an attempt to measure all of the economic activity that's happening in the economy, and so, uh, and of course, it won't catch everything, but it catches a lot of it, and it's good to compare across time. And you can see that in 1929, we're over $100 billion in gross domestic product, but that started to fall pretty dramatically, so that by 1930, we're below $100 million. By 1931, we're below $80 million. By 1932, we're below $60 million, and we're right about in the 50s. So we're probably cut in half, the gross domestic product, which means the economy shrank by, by half which is a terribly difficult thing. Come on in. Now you're good. Uh, so uh, so this, what does that mean, though, for people, ordinary people? Well, unemployment rose pretty dramatically. Well, I think I have a pointer here that I can use. So you can see... I don't have a pointer. Laser pointer. You can see that in 1929, the um, unemployment rate was 3.2%. And that's pretty low. That's almost full employment, we would say. But by 1930, it had more than doubled to 8.7%. By 1931 to 15. Now almost 16% unemployment. That's really, really high. By 1932, 23.6%, and then almost 25% by 1933. So that's much higher than anything that you would have seen in your lifetimes or that we've seen since then. So by comparison, uh, some recent peaks of unemployment in 2010, unemployment rate was 963 and that's in the, the wake of the, the great uh, collapse of the of the market in the 2010 and then in 2020 with the pandemic, we got up to about 8.3%. So at at its worst, we're about what we were in 1930, right? So we didn't nearly approach the 31, 32, or 33 levels. So that's a really intense uh, unemployment, and what that means for folks is pretty serious. Now, we are now today at 3.8%. So we're almost back down to the unemployment level that we were in 1929. So we're almost at full employment. Uh, okay. What does that mean, though, for the human experience of unemployment? And this is, the Scott's Run, is anybody here from West Virginia? No, the Scott's Run is right near Morgantown, West Virginia, and it's a coal mining community, and the mines were shut down. And so the miners were still there, still in Scott's Run, but they had no source of income, they had no food. And so their children were really, really struggling. This is from 1935, so it's after they've had some relief, this photo. But this is a family from Scott's Run, the kids. So the, the uh, Hoover administration was very concerned about children starving, and they said that we want to send the Children's Bureau out to look at what's happening at Scott's Run and see if uh, we could do something to ameliorate that suffering. And they were thinking about something like a milk program where they could bring milk to families and children could have milk. So the Children's Bureau solicited the help of the Quaker Social Action Division. And that's the, that's the American Friends Service Committee. And they went out to help figure out what was going on. And they, when they looked at the, the extent of the suffering in uh, Scott's Run, they said that they needed a bigger solution than just milk for kids. They needed something that was more comprehensive because it was such an intense suffering that was going on. And, and kids were at risk 
Uh, so they recommended something that would ultimately become the subsistence homestead program. And they said, really, to make it uh, reasonable for families to live, they need to have a healthful house. They need to have, uh, need to have a domicile somewhere to live. They need to have enough land to grow a garden because probably they're never going to have enough income to buy all their food. So they're going to need to supplement the food that they would get with the garden. They need to have some kind of part-time work, at least, to some, have some cash flow in so they could do something with their money. They would need to have some kind of community health services for when they get sick or they have babies or they have any other kind of health needs. And they probably could use a, a cooperative dairy farm, which would be helpful for folks to, to sell the milk and also to have access to the milk. And ultimately, the Quakers, because they're, they're a social organization, they're very into community. They said, what we want to do is transform this individualistic ethos into a, a community ethos that would change. So we don't, we're not competing against each other, but we're cooperating with each other in order to survive. So they said, we want to make a fairly dramatic transformation Now, uh, the Hoover administration said, well, distributing milk is one thing, but having this comprehensive transformation is too much, and we don't want to go that far. They said it's too much like socialism. So we're we're very nervous about socialism. We don't want to have that. Uh, And virtually all of western Pennsylvania in the 1920s was a heavily Republican area. So all the newspapers were Republican almost universally. And so they all, again, agreed with that, that we don't want socialism here. We don't want to have anything... Like that. I'm going to talk about Westmoreland County uh, in a bit, so that's why I have that up there. Uh, better to go hungry than to become socialist, essentially. Uh, but Hoover lost the election in 1932 to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And Roosevelt introduced a whole bunch of different programs that collectively we call the New Deal. One of those programs is the one that we want to talk about. It's how do you, how do you assist people who are struggling in old coal mining areas. So uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, his wife was a really, really strong advocate of trying to lift people up to make it so that people could live with dignity and support. Uh, And she sent emissaries out to see what was happening in the country. She wanted to get firsthand accounts from people. And some of those emissaries went out to Scott's Run to see what was going on. And they said, yeah, it's as bad as people say. Uh, People really are suffering, and we really need to do something about that. Uh, And so she thought, okay, why don't we establish a model community near Scott's Run that could be uh, to achieve all of the things that we talked about with the Quakers and the, and the subsistence homestead division, then become a model that others could emulate in other places. Uh, and eventually, this subsistence homestead program established 34 communities. So the first one is in West Virginia, near Scott's Run, uh, called Arthurdale. The next, there are two in West Virginia, there's one in western Pennsylvania, there's uh, one in Tennessee, and there are 29 others scattered throughout the country. Norvelt, which is one we'll talk about here in in western uh, Pennsylvania, turned out to be the largest one, so about 250 houses in the community. Four of those subsistence homestead communities were aimed at helping out-of-work miners. Uh, So this is, we know, a big, big, big coal mining region, and so... Uh, one, one of the goals was to allow uh, stranded industrial workers, people who were doing mining, not farming, out away from the cities to stay in the, in the hinterland because uh, the, the only places at this point that were really helping providing unemployment relief and food were the cities. So you would go to the city. Uh, the city would try and feed uh, folks who were unemployed within the city and who were struggling. We didn't have a national program yet. We didn't have statewide programs. But, but you don't want everybody coming in from the rural areas into the city because it would overwhelm the system. And the systems were already overwhelmed. So this was a really bad situation. So if we could develop these communities, these satellite communities out in the rural areas that would keep the coal miners in western Pennsylvania and West Virginia and Tennessee, then they wouldn't be coming into the cities. Then they could allow themselves to succeed. They could, we could make it possible for them to live with dignity and to live healthful and secure lives. So Arthur Dale was the first. And I want to invite you to, to look at this image. And this is the Arthurdale. This is a house that was built in the Arthurdale community. What, what strikes you about this house or what, anything from that image that you want to observe or make note of? Does it look huge? Is it a mansion? Remember we looked at the steel workers' homes and the, uh, the superintendent's homes in Homestead, Pennsylvania? Is this, which one is it more like, do you think? John? It looks like, you know, a pretty average home, I guess, for the time. I, don't, I know we talked about last time with the Cole families, you would shove, like, 
two families usually in a house. I don't know if it's kind of like that with this. But. No, so these would be, one of the ideals was that each family should have its own house. So this wouldn't be a duplex, but rather an individual house for, uh, coal, for ex-coal mining families. Can you see the outbuildings at all? I wonder if I can get this. I don't know why the thing doesn't work, and I'm not supposed to stray beyond this point, but there's, to the left of the, to the left of the house, you can see an outbuilding. It looks like a smaller house, maybe. And behind it, you can see a grape arbor coming out from the back. So the idea was that families would be able to grow grapes and then use those for jams and jellies uh, to eat uh, themselves. And then behind, you can see a garage in the back as well. Uh, Arthurdale was the first of the communities. And so all of the problems got sort of manifest in Arthurdale and then got sort of corrected in the other communities. So one of the things, they wanted to move quickly in Arthurdale... They bought prefab houses that were originally designed to be uh, vacation homes or cottages on the seashore in New England. So they were not insulated. They were used only in the summer months, typically. And so they bought them in mass, and they were having them shipped down here. But as they were waiting for them to ship down, they dug out the, the foundations for the houses. But when the houses arrived, it turned out that the foundations didn't match the houses. They had to redig foundations, and they had to readjust some of the houses they had to insulate the houses because they weren't very well insulated. They had to do a lot of adjustments that sort of were awkward and expensive transitions on the move. But Arthurdale's where they figured all of that stuff out. And here's another image of one of the Arthurdale houses. I remember the, the house is pretty small. It's only about 700 to 800 square feet. So that's not a very big house. Probably two bedrooms, a uh, bathroom, uh, uh, f- side porches so that you could go out and not get wet in the rain. You could, you could uh, get some shade. Tigard Valley is also a place in West Virginia, which was for unemployed coal workers, coal miners. You can see uh, in Tigard Valley that's got a Dutch, kind of a Dutch barn design. Each of the communities was supposed to be designed to be, uh, uh, I want to say reminiscent, but that's not the, the right word, of the region from which they came. So that it would reflect in some way the culture of the region in which the community was built. Uh, and this is what the larger uh, stretch of community was. Ah, there we go. You can see the different houses in the back. Some of them are not the Dutch uh, barn design, but in the back you can see that some of them are. Usually about five or six different house designs within a community. Cumberland Homes, Tennessee, was another coal mining community. This is, again, uh, this is a house for one single family, two bedrooms, maybe three bedrooms, uh, living room, kitchen. Uh, on that first floor. And it looks, I, uh, well, what's your impression of this house? I shouldn't impose. Is this a house you would hate to live in, Lindsay? I think it looks more like just like a typical, like, modern family household. So it would, it, w- it would fit in with today, something today? Yeah, I yeah. think so. It might be a little bit smaller, but I think you're right. It, it's an attractive design. It's made of stone. Dan, did you want to jump in with it? I'd say it's something I would live in in a heartbeat. It looks nice. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Cumberland Homes in Tennessee was also for coal miners. Um, and just as an aside, has anybody in here ever heard of Johnny Cash, the singer? Right? He grew up in a subsistence homestead community in Arkansas. So he also lived in the subsistence homestead. Not one of these four, uh, not one of these four though. So Westmoreland Homesteads is the Norvelt that's right around here. And we'll talk about how it got its new name in a little bit. And you can, what, what strikes you about this, this is a kind of a longer-range view of uh, the Norvelt community or Westmoreland homesteads. Does anything strike you in that imagery? I, I will point you first here to the resettlement administration that says here, the subsistence, the, the New Deal had a whole bunch of different organizations and they kept reshuffling them. So the subsistence homestead division became part of the resettlement administration. There were th- about 34 subsistence homestead communities built, but the resettlement administration had about another 70 or so. So there were over 100 uh, communities built through the resettlement administration and the subsistence homestead. And there were still some other organizations that were building from the federal government as well. Uh, all right, I'm going to point you at some things that might not seem uh, very meaningful. What is this thing right here? Telephone pole. Looks like a telephone pole. So probably that means that they had. What? Well, I'm sorry. 
power. So it could be electrical, it could be electrical lines, and they also had phones. They had phones and electricity. So that's, and that's a big deal, because the patch communities they were coming from often didn't have those things. Uh, anything else about the houses or about the neighborhood? Does it look attractive to you? Does it feel like, yeah? Live you would live there. Dan's going to live in Cumberland, but you're going to live here in Western Pennsylvania. Yeah, all right. Uh, okay, so why Westmoreland County? Why do they build a community? Why do they choose? And this is not very far from St. Vincent campus, about five miles from our campus. Why did they choose to, to build here? Uh, part of it was that there was a great need in Western Pennsylvania. So uh, you could see that bituminous coal production in about the World War II, or excuse me, World War I era was about 35 million tons uh, in Fayette County and then about 30 in Westmoreland County. But by 1932, they were down to a third of that. So they had really, the production of coal production had d declined very, very dramatically in this period of time. And so these coal miners were out of work. At one point, there were 500,000 coal miners in America and it was down to about 200,000 actively working uh, during the Great Depression. So there was a real concern about uh, people being out of work. In Westmoreland County, in 1933, so that was the peak of the unemployment that we saw in the last graph, 52% of people were fully employed, 21% were underemployed, we'll talk about that in a second, and, and about 27% were unemployed entirely. So 20, it's even higher in Westmoreland County than it was in the nation as a whole. But an, un, an underemployed person is somebody who wants to be working full-time and can't work full-time uh, because there's not enough uh, opportunity or, not, or the jobs don't have enough hours. And one example would be the U.S. Steel Corporation was reluctant to lay off workers outright. So they said, we want to employ people we, we want to spread out the work among all the employees. But that meant that of the period in 1933, the typical steel worker worked one day every other week. So they only got one out of uh, 14 days that they were able to work. And you just can't support a family or even yourself on one day a week. So those would be un underemployed folks. So if you add the unemployed and the underemployed, you have almost half the population of eligible workers who want to work who don't have a job and who aren't going to be able to do it. So this is a really... This is a place that was suffering really badly. And as evidence, I want to I look at what, what was it like. Calumet is a western Pennsylvania coal patch community. And coal patch is what they call the small communities that were built around a, a mine entrance, the shaft entrance. Uh, what strikes you about this photo? We just were looking at the homestead photos. Hannah. The house looks pretty run down. And it definitely doesn't look as nice as the ones that you just showed us. And I don't know if you can tell, but this is actually a duplex. So that's half, that's another family over there. And then these guys are over here. So you're saying it looks like it's more run down than the other. Okay. Like the other houses you showed us earlier in the year. For yeah, the yeah. The, yeah. You, would, you would move from here to one of those other houses? Yeah. Uh, and this is... This is a house where people actually still are able to stay within their home, and a lot of times the miners were evicted from their homes once the mine shut down. Uh, I think this is the backyard of the house. You can see on the wash tub hanging up on the wall over here. Uh, you can see that there's an attempt to have a garden. Whoops, I lost my... Anyway, there's a garden. As we look in between the two, you can see there's a garden with some tomato plants, I think, growing, and then on the right is mostly flowers. Folks from Calumet would be eligible to come to Norvelt. So these are folks that who might be willing to move, or certainly be willing to move, and they might try and get into Norvelt. Uh, this is a Coke oven. And we talked about Coke ovens a little bit before, but the Coke oven, the, the steel mills want a source of uh, fuel that burns at a high temperature and at a relatively even temperature for making steel. The coal that comes out of the mines, particularly the, the bituminous coal that comes out of the mines, has a, very, has a lot of impurities in it, and it has an uneven the temperature will spike and it'll come down and it'll spike. And so what the coal companies would do is they would turn the coal into coke. And then the coke is what the steel mills would use for the uh, fuel. In order to do that, they would put the coal into this coke oven and they would brick up the front of the, they would close that entire hole with brick. And then they would cook it for a couple of days in there. And then the impurities would come out through a, a hole in the roof, through a chimney. And then at the end of a couple of days, they'd break down this brick, and then they would be able to pull out the coke, and then they would put the coke on the trains that would then go to the steel mills. 
But the Coke ovens were idled because the mines were idled, and so there was nobody really working. And these Coke ovens were empty, so people who didn't have homes were moving into the Coke ovens. So we had people living in the Coke ovens. And you can see this woman is somebody who was living in the Coke oven at that time. Uh, and it was really hard for people who didn't have homes to find places. We also saw people living in caves in Western Pennsylvania, uh, or just or living outside in tents. It was a really it was a great struggle. There were a lot of unemployed and a lot of homeless people in Western Pennsylvania. Okay, uh, here is a typical Western Pennsylvania coal mining family. How how many children? Six kids, and then two parents. So remember, these, we'll look at the floor plan in a little bit, but these would be two-bedroom houses, living room, kitchen, and two bedrooms above. So there'd be a lot of people uh, together in a bedroom. Uh, it'd be a little bit crowded. Quality of the inside of the house or of the furniture? Sydney, you're shaking your head. What do you mean? Like the best quality that you can get. So you, it looks older, or? Yeah, I would say Run down. Maybe some chipping paint along the, yeah. the bed. Okay. I'm sorry, Dan? Standard issue military. It does look like it could be. Uh, all right. The walls, you can see that there are some holes in the walls. They have the knee high. I don't know if you can see the calendar. Oh, and I lost my pointer. Uh, oh, there it is. Knee high is a soda company, so they would have a calendar you could hang up, and you could use that as to, to patch a hole in the wall if you could hang it calendar in front. All right. Eleanor Roosevelt was the wife of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and she was really powerfully invested in, this, in uh, improving people's lives. And so she became a great champion of the subsistence homestead communities. And she was like the sponsor for the Arthurdale community. She invested a lot, not only of her time coming to Arthurdale on a regular basis. She went to every high school graduation in Arthurdale. She was out there multiple times a year, but she also invested a lot of her personal wealth in Arthurdale, trying to make things work. So she, she really was a mover in uh, the subsistence homestead uh, movement in the division. And she was a strong advocate in a number of ways. In order to build houses cheaply, you can do that more efficiently if you don't put a bathroom in and if you don't put a kitchen in. If you don't have plumbing, you don't have electricity. You can make those houses uh, for much less money. And a number of people in the Roosevelt administration were saying, these folks are coming from coal mine patch communities. They don't have electricity now. They have an outhouse now. They don't have indoor plumbing now. Why would we provide all of those things for them in this subsistence homestead community? But she said, no, 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 we have to provide houses with indoor toilets, with running water in the kitchens, furnaces for heat, electricity. And these are the things that would allow somebody to live with dignity. So she's an advocate of the cooperative ethos in this subsistence homestead division, but so is Clarence Pickett, who was the Quaker in charge of those four communities that we looked at, the, the four coal mining communities. So he's the guy who's the administrator, the federal administrator, hired by the federal government to run these communities from Washington, D.C. He also maintained his job as the head of the American Friends Service Committee, the Quaker Social Action Division. So he had two jobs during that period of time. So he's a, he's a powerful player also in the development of this. All right, so... I want to take a look at the, the, the um, map of Norvelt. Let's see if I can get my thing going again. Uh, you can see in the upper left corner, you can see the state of Pennsylvania. And I don't know why I don't always get this. And then here we go. This is Westmoreland County, which is in the southwestern part of western Pennsylvania. This is Westmoreland County enlarged. And then within Westmoreland County is Norvelt. You can see Latrobe is right there. And then here is the street map of Norvelt. So what strikes you about the street map? John? It's pretty crowded. There's like, everything's right next to each other, it seems like. Especially if we don't know the scale. Yeah, especially right? like... So um, how, and this is a question, how big, so do you see the plots of land? Those, uh, yeah. I'm trying to get, I can't do that. Each of those plots is between two and five acres. So it turns out to be a fairly large stretch of uh, area of land. Uh, I'm going to contrast it with, this is, this is the street plan of a coal patch community in Western PA. So what's different between these two communities? Dan? Norvelt's more spread out, and 
the coal patch community is packed in like sardines. Much closer pl packed in. And you can see if I could get this thing to work consistently. And I don't know why I can't. Oh, there we go. Each of these dark things is a house. And then that's the plot that the house is on. You can see that they are packed in, right? <clears throat> Much more closely. The Norveld houses, which don't really, it's harder to see. Each little dot at the front of these is a Norveld house. They have their expanse of land behind them. There isn't really much of an expanse of land here in the coal patch. Anything else strike you? One of them is a, is a grid, right? Rectangular grid. And the other one is not. Any idea why that might be? Think about where you live now. Is it a grid or is it curvy linear streets? Or neither, I suppose. <clears throat> there was a movement in, in uh, city planning in the early 20th century called the Newtown Movement, and they thought that the curvilinear streets were a much more pleasant way to live, so that you didn't, that this was too factory-like. This sort of the grid was very, very rudimentary, was very regimented, and it was not as appealing for people. Uh, so they recommended the curvilinear streets, and you can see that in a lot of the different communities that were built, that were planned uh, in the early 20th century. Um, here is actually the design made in D Washington, D.C. for what uh, a subsistence homestead plot might look like. I don't know if you can make out the words at all here. Oh, here we go. What, can, you, can you read that? Yeah, yeah. So this, well, here's the house. Let's start with that. That's the house. And then to, right to the next to the house, there, the aim was to have an orchard of fruit trees right next to the house so that those fruit trees could then feed the family. You would have access to apples or whatever other fruit trees that you would have, pears, whatever. Behind the orchard, can you see, I don't know if you can make that out. Chicken yard. Yeah, the idea was that you would have a chicken coop right here, and then the chickens could run free in the chicken yard, and you would have eggs then. So each family would have fruit from the trees. It would take a while for those trees to mature and to produce fruit, but eventually you'd have fruit from the trees, you would have eggs from the chickens, and then on to right directly behind the house, I don't know if you can see that at all. Right here. Vegetable garden. Vegetable garden. And it says here a half of an acre, I think, or even a quarter of an acre. But there's also, on here, there's more. There's strawberries, deer berries. I don't know if anybody, what a deer berry is? I'm not sure. Okay. In the woods, but deer just eat them up like candy. Uh, do you know that for sure, Dan? Or you, okay. I did. All right. And then, the, and then asparagus. So they're saying you should, this is going to be the household's garden. So this garden is going to feed the household. But then if you look beyond that garden, you can see, eh, I'm not getting it. This is a, what they call a truck crop, uh, half of an acre. You could also grow food that you intend to sell somewhere. So you could generate some income for your house by growing food that you would sell in the Trobe or in Greensburg or somewhere where you could get money for the food. And then finally at the top, that's a pasture. And the idea here was that you would have about uh, an acre per cow. This is one and a half acres that could sustain a cow and a half. But you might get the milk then from the cow. So, and there's a garage, which I, oh, I just lost. There we go. There's a garage right back here. So the house is here, the garage is here, and then the cow would be back here. But that's not exactly how uh, Norvelt came out. This is actually the plan for Norvelt. So this would be a household in Norvelt. Uh, this is the house. That's the garage. And this would be a driveway up to the garage. This is the street here. And that street would have gone right in front of this house right here. What is this here? Can you read that? That might be a little bit tougher. We need front row people with good eyes who can read that. I, disposal field. Disposal field. What? You have any ideas of what that might be? Almost like a compost field, so you can take your uh, decomposable garbage, throw it there, let it break down, so that way you can um, have. Homemade fertilizer for your garden. <clears throat> okay. A little bit. If I could take you one more level down. One level down. <laughs> yeah, what might that be? Just a place where you can dump your trash. 
What kind of trash might go in a disposal field? Uh, no ideas? Waste. Yeah, human waste. Right, so the old, the, the coal patch communities had uh, outhouses. They don't have outhouses, they have indoor toilets, but they don't have a sewer system to hook up to. And so they're dispersing all of the human waste into this field here. Uh, so you don't want to grow your garden in there. Uh, you want to grow your garden back a little bit farther. And so the garden would end up being back over there. Uh, in Norvelt, we end, they ended up not having uh, a cow in a pasture. Everybody did get chickens, and we'll look at that in a little bit. Okay. Uh, and here is the actual f design at the time that it was built of the Norvelt curvilinear streets. You can see that there is a town center here. There are a number of things there, and we'll talk about those in a little bit. But you can see the different neighborhoods. And I don't know if you can see more clearly here than on the other one. Each of the dots within each of these plots is where the house is. So the houses were located along the street rather than back in the property. You have five acres. You could build your house way back if you wanted to. And a lot of people would find that appealing. But because there was such a commitment to developing community, they wanted the houses to be close to each other. So everybody was just a little bit back from the street, 25, 30 feet back from the street, and they were close by each other. So you could interact with your neighbors on a regular basis. And then all the gardens would be behind the house. Okay, so that's what Norvelt looked like after it was built. I don't know if you can see all that. Jesse, I keep thinking I'm in your way. I apologize for that. All right. Uh, does anything strike you about this image? No. Lindsay. I was going to say, like, all the houses look the same. They're very similar. <coughs> they have only about six different house designs. And they're all, what, do, what style would you call that? Or do you have a sense of what that style might be? It just looks like a typical, like, family home, I guess. I don't... I guess that's what I would call it. I don't know. A family home. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that seems fair, because that's certainly what they were. In order to get into Norville, you had to have kids. There had to be a couple with children in order to get into Norville. Uh, it, most people look at that and say it looks like a Cape Cod design. But the architect who is from Greensburg, who designed these houses, said they were a Pennsylvania farmhouse style. But they seem more like, to me, they seem more like a Cape Cod design, with this one exception, which I think is really curious, and I'm not 100% sure why, but... You can see here on this house and here on this house, there's no front door. There's no door on the front of the house. So the doors are on the sides of the houses. This one seems to have a door. So I think it's four out of the six designs didn't have a front door. It didn't have a door on the front facade of the house. I'm going to bet that the houses that you grew up in have doors on the front, right? So that if you're standing in the street and you're looking at your house, you can see a door in the front. That's, excuse me, almost standard for uh, housing, but this was a different design. And I'm not sure why. I tried to find, figure out why that was. I know for other communities, some commentators have said uh, the, the struggles of the Great Depression were so enormous that they were insulating the family against the street, which represented the public life and represented the struggles. But you would go out your side door and you would see your neighbor, and that would give you a kind of a sense of community uh, as opposed to the front door. I don't know if that's persuasive or not, but that's the only explanation that I could see for wanting to build the house that way. Because whenever you see a Cape Cod design, you see a front door somewhere on the front of the house, but not in Norville. Again, you do have the wires for electricity and for phones. Where are the kids walking? In the middle of the street, right? So it must be a relatively unbusy area. That's where they're... Where they're tra okay. Uh, in order to develop that community that was really important to the Quakers and therefore the people of Norvelt, they had a whole bunch of communal activities that you could do. And they tried to do everything, all of the building, on their own premises. So they, the, the people who were going to live in the house, the, the future residents, actually built the houses under the supervision of skilled carpenters and, uh, and builders. And they also built the furniture that would go in the house. So the kitchen tables were being built in the carpentry shop. Uh, and also, I don't know if you can see, but there on the side, there would be the shutters were built in the carpentry shop as well. And so people who were going to be residents of Norvold got to, got to do the work on their homes and got paid for it. And a, a wage was a really important thing at that time. So this was a really big deal. Uh, and they had to have gardens. And the gardens had to be at least one acre. So the idea was you were going to commit to doing serious gardening. I don't know, is anybody here a gardener? 
A little bit. An acre garden would be big. That would, that's pretty large. My grandparents have a, whenever we go to Virginia, they have a, an acre garden. It's huge, and it's, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, I would think, right? And they don't have a lot of mechanized tools to help them here. So one of the things we discovered in our oral interviews of residents of Norvelt who grew up there as kids was that they were assigned uh, a couple hours of garden chores every day. When they come home from school, they'd have to go out and they'd have to get the bugs off the leaves and they would have to try and uh, keep the gardens going. And, and they hated it, by and large. They said these were, the, these were terrible, terrible things. Uh, and so, and we'll see at the end when Norvelt finally, when the houses were sold, the federal government sold them to the residents, which doesn't happen until after World War II, people abandoned their gardens pretty quickly or it shrank them down very dramatically. Uh, there also was a cooperative poultry enterprise so that they would have all of these chickens living in the Norvelt area uh, in this, on this farm in Norvelt and they would try and sell those eggs then and then this, the revenue from the eggs would come back into the cooperative community and would give the people who worked on the farms a wage, they would have a job and would also generate profits that would go back into the community that could be then used to invest in other parts of the community. Uh, but every house also had 50 chickens. So it wasn't like they were hurting for eggs themselves, so they really did want this to sell the eggs somewhere. And the biggest uh, consumer of the eggs was the Civilian Conservation Corps. I don't know if anybody's heard of the CCC, which worked in the Laurel Highlands here to build trails and to repair uh, trails for people to enjoy. It, it was almost like a military camp, so it would be young men between the ages of 18, let's say, and 21 who would go live in the woods in these barracks that were constructed for their purpose. They would get paid a dollar a day, and they would get fed three meals, and the money they were obligated to send home to their families. They weren't, it wasn't money for them to gamble with or something like that. They had to send that money home. But the Norvelt eggs were used to, to feed those folks in the Civilian Conservation Corps up around here. Uh, and there was a dairy and beef cattle farm, and there was uh, pigs grown in Norvelt again, by this cooperative enterprise, the goal of which was to raise money for the community. Uh, there was, this is the co-op store, which by today's standards might look a little bit small, smaller than the giant eagle that you may be accustomed to, sh to shopping at. But this was a great leap forward, they said, because of something that, <coughs> excuse me, that you may not realize happened before. The typical grocery store run would be you would go into the grocer with your list of materials. This is what I want. You'd hand it to the grocer who's behind a counter, and the grocer would go around and fill a basket with all this stuff and then hand you the basket. And then you would either say, I can pay you for it, or can I put this on my tab, and I'll pay you it some, some day for it. But this new idea of the supermarket was that you were actually going to be able to peruse the shelves yourself and pick out your own loaf of bread and say, this is the loaf that I want to buy, or here's the can that I want to get, rather than just give the, the list to the worker behind the counter. They thought that this was going to attract a lot of people from Greensburg and other places who might drive out to the co-op store to, to buy the food. It turned out not to be the case. Uh, and because they were paying a living wage to the people who worked in the co-op store, and because they had a, some upfront costs in building these things, the, the prices were a little bit higher in the co-op store than they would have been in the neighboring farm for uh, materials or food and from other grocery stores. And so they were always trying to get the Norvelt residents to come and buy from the co-op store, but the residents could save money by going elsewhere. And so there was always this tension between trying to, in some ways, cajole and in other ways compel residents to come to the co-op store so that everybody can flourish within the community. Never quite worked out. Uh, one of the elements of the subsistence homestead community was you'd have those gardens and you would feed much of your family from the gardens, but there was a hope that you could have a factory in the community as well and that people could work at least part-time in the factory. And by doing that, they would have some cash income and they could use that cash income to then buy clothes or to do, to do whatever. But it was really hard during the midst of the Great Depression to attract a factory to come set up shop here in Norville. They eventually got a garment factory to come in. And that garment factory, so they, the federal government actually built the factory for the garment uh, manufacturer. And then the garment man manufacturer came in and ran the factory, had to pay prevailing wages, couldn't uh, undercut the, uh, the wages of the workers, so it was going to be helpful to the workers. That garment industry really finally took off 
as with the run-up to World War II, and they started needing uniforms for the military, the garment factory was able to produce a lot of those uniforms. And so Norvelt finally got underway. At one point, the garment industry was employing about 100 women. It was women were working in the garment factory. 100 women from Norvelt. Norvelt had 250 homes. So it's fewer than half of the households provided somebody who could work in the garment industry, but it was there, and it was a going concern for a while. It did burn down later, and so the garment industry is gone. The factory is gone. Uh, They had a mother's club. So the idea was that the mothers would get together, and they would interact with each other, and they could raise money, and they could work for good causes and help the local elementary school. They built an elementary school in Norvelt as well. and they had something called study groups. So this whole notion, remember, the, the Quakers were really big on community and in, in social interaction. But that's not the American ethos. It's much more individualistic. And so they had to try and persuade people. Here are the vir- virtues of community interaction. Here's why. And so they had these study groups set up that would meet in somebody, each neighborhood would have somebody who would host the study group, and they would meet in the homes, and they would read something and talk about it in the group. And the idea of transforming culture to be more communal rather than individualistic. They also had community loom, and so they would teach people who were interested in uh, to weave. If they wanted to weave coverlets or they wanted to leave, weave uh, blankets or whatever for their home, they could do so in the Norvelt community loom. They had an annual fair, and at the fair, people would do group singing. So there were t- all these activities are trying to bring people together. You can see an image of them singing at the, group fa- at the community fair. Uh, this was m- maybe the most popular club this was a drama club. So this is the time before television. So, and there's no movie theater in Norville. You'd have to drive quite a ways to get to a movie theater. But this group of uh, residents would get together and they'd put on plays for each other. So that was very popular, both for people who wanted to go see the play, but also for the people who wanted to participate in it. It's a really active community organization. So you can see that there's a lot of stuff happening in Norville where they're trying to knit the community together so that there would be strong uh, ethos of communal... Uh, Togetherness. And they put a nursery school in Norvelt, so for young kids who could get a leg up on education so they could get an advantage over others. Uh, the, the WPA hired, the Work Progress Administration hired out of work artists. One artist lived in Norvelt, and he did, and those out of work artists were, were commissioned to do murals on federal buildings, which meant mostly post offices. So if you went into a post office, you could see a mural painted on the wall that would give you the history of that community. And in Norvelt, they didn't have very much of a history because it's only three or four years old or so, but they did a, the, the muralist did a mural of the community life in Norvelt. And in, this was the dairy lunch or a soda shop that was in the community center that was near the co-op store. So people could come in and get an ice cream cone and they could come in and get a soda. And so this was uh, the mural on there. And some of it survives till today in Hoffer's funeral home, I believe. You can see the, the this is the color version of that mural that suggests the kinds of uh, elements that were prized in the Norvell community, one of which was community baseball. Most local communities had a baseball team that competed against other local communities, and Norvell was no exception. And that was a way to, to provide identity. I think almost in a way that today in western Pennsylvania, the high school football team kind of provides a kind of a community identity. Uh, I don't know, maybe that's a stretch coming from the Trobe. I don't think we have a long tradition here of successful high school football. But uh, at any rate, it was a way for the community to gather around and cheer on their team. And so uh, most coal patch communities had them. In fact, coal companies would recruit really good baseball players to represent their team in the league competition. And those people would often be given uh, above-ground jobs so that they could be at their best for the baseball games. The community is a really important thing for communities to, to be successful in baseball. And the H on this man's sweater is for Hearst High School, which was a local high school where Norvelt folks would end up going to high school. Uh, oops, I went too fast. There was a cooperative association that was run by the residents themselves. So they were the board for the cooperative association. You could see them in a meeting right here. Notice that they're all men, though. So the, the community board in Norvelt was all male. Uh, here's a 601 version. 601 is a, the name of a house design. This is the, one of the larger houses. It has three bedrooms, I think, two on the second floor and one on the first floor. So, uh, and this is new. This is a later edition. So the, forget about that part over there. But what do you see here? Now, this is the trees are more mature. So this is taken a little bit later, right? 
But what strikes you here? Like, can you even identify the buildings there? Lindsay. Um, I was going to say, like, the one on the left would be the shed. I mean, not the shed, the garage. The garage, yeah. And then the other one would be the shed for, like, gardening tools and stuff like that. It looks like it could be, but it actually serves a different purpose. That was a good... I think the garden tools might end up in the garage at some point. Fewer than half of the Norvelt residents had cars. And so they, they all had garages, but they didn't have cars to put in the garage. And the idea was that at some point they would have a garage, they would have a car that could get into that garage. Uh, but they could store things in there. What else is happening? We talked a little bit about it. It looks like a really fancy version of one. I want to say it's the outhouse. Oh, uh, that would be a fancy version of an outhouse, right? <laughs> you could have a party in there. Uh, no, 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 it's a chicken coop. So they, every family was given 50 chickens, so they could get eggs from there. And then they could take any surplus eggs and send them to the, co- the co-op to be sold. But they had a chicken coop. So, and what you can't see here, which has been connecting the house to the garage, I think it comes in a later picture. And by the way, this is the garden. So you get a kind of an overview of the garden here, too. It's a fairly substantial garden. This is the grape arbor. So you're looking at the community through the through the grape arbor. Now, this is early on, so there are no grapes yet growing. A lot of this was an investment. It would take years and years for the grapes, to, the vines to grow and for the grapes and to, to yield grapes that were usable. So this notion that this would be useful at some point in the future. All right, what else do you see here in the image? Kelsey, does anything strike you? Or You've got the winding roads that we talked about before. Okay. Can you tell what this is here? We saw it in the last picture we were remarking on. Like the chicken coop? Yeah, that's the chicken coop right there. I tried to replicate this photo about five years ago. And I went to about where this was taken, and I looked out, and all I could see are trees. So all the trees have grown up, and you can't tell the houses anymore. It's, it's all trees, but... Uh, let me see if we can move on here. That's the grape arbor with grapes on it. So it eventually could get the grapes on the grape arbor. And you can see that not only does it provide grapes, but you could set up seating underneath. And so on a hot day, you'd get nice shade from that. And it would connect the garage to the house over here. And notice that on each wall of the house, there are windows. And we'll talk about that in a little bit when we look at an interior shot. And this is a mature tree on the left. You can see that that's obviously been grown up quite a bit. So this is years later. Here's a kitchen in a Norvelt house. Any, what do you observe in that kitchen? <coughs> Laura, what do you see when you look in the kitchen there? It appears they have an icebox or a refrigerator of some kind, along with running water, like um, Eleanor Roosevelt promised. Um, honestly, it looks like a nice kitchen for the time. The floors aren't right. probably wooden and shabby like they would have had at their previous house, and they have cabinet space and what looks to be like a newish kind of pot or pan on the countertop. Where, where is that? Um, kind of in the middle of the shot. Oh, right here. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, is that All a right. teapot? I can't really see that well. All right. And what's above the sink? Uh, another window. Two windows, actually. Two windows. So if there were, <laughs> if they both were open, you could get a breeze coming through the room. And that was really important to the designers. They wanted to be able to get fresh air into the homes. And light. And light as well. How many kids would you say are in the photo? Three kids. It looks like maybe there's a fourth child right oh. there. One, two, I think by feet I can tell. Is that, am I accurate with that? Three, four children, and the mother presumably there. So, and a clock on top of the refrigerator there. Refrigerator is possible because they have electricity. They wouldn't have had electricity in the coal patch community, so that's, that's a great savings for them, for food won't spoil. All right, so uh, I want to look at a typical coal patch floor plan. You can see that you got the kitchen, and you have a parlor, which would be a living room, and then 
right next door, it's a duplex, so right next door, the exact same layout, and then above them would be two bedrooms, exactly the same. So that's very similar to the steelworker's home that we looked at a couple of weeks ago. Uh, here's a Norvelt design. So what's different or the same about the Norvelt design and the coal patch house? One thing might jump out at you, John. I was just going to say, like, if we're talking about similarities, you still have the living room and the kitchen. Like, they look kind of relatively the same size for the pictures. Uh, what's different, you have a bathroom in the Norbell house, which that's, is pretty huge. That's huge, right, to have yeah. a bathroom, right? Because these guys are going to the outhouse in the coal patch community. Okay. And then on either, again, uh, no front door, right? So you have a side entrance into the kitchen and you have a side entrance into the living room. All access through a porch over there. And you can't really tell very well, but there's a, there's a vent into each of the bedrooms on the second floor, and there's vents into each of the rooms on the first floor. There's a furnace in the basement, and the furnace is generating heat so that the, in the depths of winter, each of those rooms is going to have heat, except for the bathroom. But how bad could it be to go sit on a toilet when it's 30 degrees in the room? <laughs> so, that, Norvelt residents, in their memories, say that was pretty tough, uh, not having heat in the bathroom. Uh, okay. Uh, in, the 19, in 1940, the federal government did a survey, a health survey of coal mining communities. And they compared what they said as a company-owned house in Kentucky, right here, to a privately, they called it a privately owned house in western Pennsylvania, both housing coal miners. Somehow they forgot or didn't know that that privately owned house is a Norvelt house that at that point would have been owned by the federal government and it would have been built by the residents working for the federal government at that time. But I thought that was pretty interesting. Where would you rather live? That's a tough call, right? Yeah. Uh, but you can get a sense that uh, if you're in the Norvelt house, there's a commitment to your dignity, to your security, your warmth in the winter, to your privacy. Those kind of things are really important. And in the, in the company house, not so much. And then it's going to get even grimmer still, I think. There's that Calumet bedroom that we looked at before. And then compare that to the a Norvelt bedroom. So what are you seeing between those two? John? There's a window. Yeah. In, in fact, you can't... Oh, I went too far. You can't really tell. There's a window here. There's also a window right here. So there are two windows in the bedroom. So you are going to get maybe some light and some air coming through there. There might be a window in the Calumet bedroom, but it's not evident from the angle of the photograph that we have. Does it look like the Norvelt bedroom is huge in comparison to the Calumet bedroom? Hannah says, no. The houses are pretty small still. They're only 700 to 800 square feet. That's a pretty small house, right? So they're not that they didn't build mansions for folks. But is there anything else about the bedrooms? Which, which would you rather, Lindsay? Well, I'd rather live in the Norvelt bedroom. Why but, is that? Okay. Um, the walls are, like, fresh and clean, and same with, like, the furniture in the building or in the bedroom. So it looks like it would be a clean, sanitary, healthful yeah. place. Okay. The walls yeah. in the Norvelt bedroom also look like they're painted and not paper wall or wallpaper. Like I think you're the, right. Uh, yeah. Bedroom. yeah, and that might be in part to hide more... The wallpaper may be hiding holes and things like that. In the, in the Norvelt bedroom, it's a plaster and lathe, and it's painted over. Okay. Coal patch kitchen. And there's a Norvelt kitchen that we saw before. Sydney, where do you want to get your next meal? I would have to say the Norvelt. <laughs> now, why is that? What do you see in the, in the coal patch? Um, it just looks dirty, and I... Wouldn't want my food cooked there. It doesn't seem very sanitary. So part of that, maybe the floor? Does the floor yeah. look... It's better to have the tile floor? Yes. Okay. 
Where's the source of water in the kitchen in the coal patch house? Joe? Did they have a, a well outside? Probably would have had a, a pump outside, right, to a well, and they would have brought the water in in buckets to use on the stove. Anything else? Yeah, and um, in the coal patch, you don't really see a fridge, so they don't really have electricity like that. So they don't. Yeah, they don't have electricity. They don't have refrigeration, so that's going to be a drawback, right? How many of you brought a refrigerator with you to school if you're living on campus? Everybody has a refrigerator. Not everybody. Josie, no refrigerator. Oh, you're not on campus. That's right. All right. Fair enough. Uh, it's very helpful to have a refrigerator, right? Uh, all right, so Norville got a new name. It was Westmoreland Homesteads until the federal government built a post office in Westmoreland Homesteads. And so there was a competition sponsored by the local residents to name the post office. And so that competition was won by somebody who suggested we take the last three letters of Eleanor Roosevelt, and first name Eleanor, and the last four letters of the Roosevelt name and we combined them into Norvelt. Because Eleanor Roosevelt was like the patron saint of the subsistence homestead community, they wanted to honor her because of the great support that she had given, so they call it Norvelt in her honor. And if you go into Norvelt today, you can see the, the volunteer fire department is uh, connected to Roosevelt Hall, which is a banquet hall you could rent out for things. And they have a big uh, uh, bust plaque to Eleanor Roosevelt. She really is beloved in the, in the community. The Roosevelts were great supporters of the subsistence homestead communities. Uh, there's a, there was a community in New Jersey, for example, that was for unemployed uh, garment workers in Brooklyn, largely Jewish garment workers. And that community, after uh, World War II, was renamed Roosevelt. I, th I think it was Heightstown before that, but it was renamed Roosevelt. So you can, almost in almost every state, you can find a community named Roosevelt, some of which were subsistence homestead communities in honor of the, of the Roosevelt family. Okay, so did, was Norvelt successful? That's a big question, right? Did it succeed? And I think the answer is mostly yes, because residents did live in security and relative comfort. You saw the comparison between the coal patch community and the, and the Norvelt house. Uh, they did form strong bonds with each other. They were connected to each other in very powerful ways. Uh, and that these factors and the building of an elementary school within Norvelt and then the access to the local Mount Pleasant High School leveraged their children to go on to great uh, professional successes. So the Norvelt, old-timer Norvelt tell you about their children who are doctors and lawyers and who are living perhaps in other places, but they're certainly successful. Uh, the, the community largely stayed put, so you didn't get a lot of people leaving Norvelt. So they were in there, and they loved living in Norvelt, and when they had the opportunity to buy their homes, they didn't they didn't move to Greensburg. They actually stayed and bought the homes that they were living in. So that the, the, the residents seemed to really like Norvelt quite a bit. Uh, and at, at its peak, the uh, factory in Norvelt employed about 100 women. So there was success in there in supporting families. And the houses in the community of Norvelt remains, even though the co-op store, the dairy barn, the uh, poultry operation, those have all gone away. They did not last. But the houses have lasted. I don't know if anybody's driven through the Norvelt area. You can see those houses are still there. Often they've been expanded. Almost all of them have been tripled in size or something like that. But you can see the sort of the core of the old Norvelt design in a lot of those houses. Uh, people really like living there. But, and then here's the, the kind of the other side, some limitations and concerns. Uh, residents never moved as fully into the community as, as the Quakers had hoped that they would. And so that individualism really, really permeated uh, the community. So the community, the residents, had agitated throughout the entire time. The homes were built in like 1934, 1935. They wanted to buy those homes. They didn't want to be part of a cooperative. They wanted to ha have individual home ownership. And when the federal government in 1946 said, we want to get out of the home business, we don't want to be landlords, we don't want to run these communities anymore, we want to unload all of these subsistence homestead communities. They proposed to the people of Norvelt that they form, a, they, they form a cooperative association that would own all the homes and that people could buy individual shares. So you would, you would buy a share of the Norvelt community that would allow you to live in a particular house. 
And the people rejected it. The residents rejected it out of hand. They said, no, 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 we want to buy our individual home. And so that's what they did in 1946, 47. They, they bought their homes. And almost, almost every single home went to the resident. They, they wanted to stay in Norville and they wanted to own their homes. Uh, oh, we just talked about that. Okay. Uh, the co-op store never really made it. I mean, it was always on the verge of uh, profitability and never really kind of made it there. Even though the residents were exhorted to buy from the co-op store because it would help the community, uh, they were in pretty desperate straits for the most part, so they went with wherever they could get the food the cheapest, and that's where they bought their food. And so that notion that you would make that deeper sacrifice for the community to buy in the co-op store so that people could have, earn a wage in the co-op store that would help them support their family, it never prevailed uh, as much as it was uh, attempted to. They tried to get a health care co-op going. There were 250 families in Norvelt. The most they could ever get to join, I think it was a dollar a month to join, and then all of your medical was covered. The most they could ever get was about 60 to 63 families joining the co-op, and it wasn't enough to sustain it over the long haul. The doctors loved it because they got paid. They always got paid when they went out and did stuff. But, uh, but it, never, it never made it. It really needed 200 or more people to belong, and, and they couldn't get that threshold, so that the health care never sort of made it. Uh, Gardening turns out to be really hard work for those of you who have a garden or who have relatives who have a garden. And so to maintain a one-acre garden is really hard. So once people bought their homes, they stopped gardening by and large or shrank the garden very, very dramatically and bought their food at stores. So that that whole notion that, which I think is a very romantic ideal and a kind of back to the land where you would grow your own food, how powerfully independent that would make you, it just, it was unpersuasive that people actually had to do the gardening uh, there. Okay, and the most important, uh, I think, drawback is that uh, the Quakers had really, really pushed for local democratic governance so that you, the members of the community, would make the decisions on behalf of the community. And there were eventually 250 homes built, uh, but they weren't, they weren't all built in one day. They were built over time, and so it it took a few years. And when the original uh, residents moved in, they got together, and they said... Uh, we don't want to admit any African-American families into our community. We want it to remain an all-white community. And so the Quaker managers were sort of struggling because they they did not endorse that. But they were really committed to this local control idea that the community would make a decision about who would live there and who wouldn't live there. So they allowed that to go forward and said, we're going to exclude African-Americans. But one African-American family said, no, that's, that's not right, and they wrote to the Roosevelt's and said, we need to be admitted to this. You can't exclude us on the basis of race. And so that one African-American family was admitted to the community of Roosevelt. Their name was White, ironically. Those were the Whites uh, who moved in there. Norvelt was built in the mid-1930s. We are now almost 100 years later. That is the only African-American family ever to live in Norvelt. So no other African-American family has moved in, and they have long gone. They're gone now. So... Uh, it, it remained a largely segregated community, and I think that's a big drawback. For a, for a federally sponsored community to maintain racial segregation is, a, is a, an issue. Okay, finally, uh, these two folks, this is uh, Lois Wyant and then this is Earl Seville, uh, grew up in Norvelt in the 1930s, and they spearheaded the movement to get a Norvelt historical marker established for the town so that it's on the map of official Norvelt communities. And uh, you can see, I, you can't see, they're beaming. They're very happy in this image uh, because they love, they love Norvelt and they want to keep it going. That community spirit survives. That sense of commitment to Norvelt still persists over time. And so in many ways, that's a success, uh, even though it's built on a foundation of racial segregation. Okay, that's the end of the presentation. Do we have any comments or questions How many of you have been to Norvelt? Just Dan. Oh, have you have you been to Norvelt also? Have you been to the golf course or just that's to where I've been? That's where you've been to the golf course. Yeah. That was the old dairy farm. That's where yeah. the cows were uh, on the golf course. So do you do you see Alex? Can you see the old houses when you drive in there? Can you see the kind of the the core of that Cape Cod design? Mm-hmm. Still seem like an attractive community. Yeah, you, know, you were hesitant there. I saw <laughs> it seemed a little bit. Okay, Norvelt just about three years ago put in a public sewer system, so they had to dig out the streets and they had to put in the pipes and the 
in the sewers. And so that now they're no longer on septic or no longer on the disposal field, but now they're using the, the sewers, uh, the community, the, the town sewers, the municipal sewers. Yeah, Lindsay. I guess, like, um, how we talked about, like, the house is being, like, more, like, they got added on to. So, like, are they still, like, family homes today? Or yeah. are they more so, like, maybe, like, retirement homes? I don't know, like. No, there, there was... the, what, an interesting thing happened there. Remember, everybody had two to five acres. So as the families, as the children grew in the families and came into adulthood, their parents had this huge plot of land. And so what happened a lot was that they built another house on the land back farther from the first house. So you could see the original house there, and then you could see like a ranch house farther back, and maybe another house beyond that, because there's so much land that they had that they built. So they were able to keep families kind of in the neighborhood a lot. But they're, they're single-family homes. Uh, they're, they're not retirement communities or anything like that. Would you rather live in a coal patch community or in a subsistence homestead community? This is a big debate now because, remember, that building that Norvelt community sounded like socialism to a lot of people. And so there's a lot of resistance to it. Uh, but the... There were 250 homes. There were well over 1,000 families who tried to get into those homes. It was very high demand. So even though all of the local papers were saying, this is a terrible thing, this is socialism, we shouldn't do this, <clears throat> the people who were struggling really, really wanted to participate in Norville. And so they had, a, they had a, a process by which you had to apply to get in, and then you had to be interviewed by these Quaker college students who were working on their social work degrees or something, and they would say, try and discern, are you committed to the community ethos or are you too committed to the individualistic ethos? Are you really going to do one-acre garden? Do you have the gardening skills to do that? Do you have the commitment to do that? It's a lot of work. They did this kind of ferreting process where they were trying to figure out who would be a good resident in Norville. And they did uh, have to evict three families who had failed to maintain their gardens and failed to maintain their homes. And so there was inspection, so you had to maintain it. And while the federal government owned the homes, you couldn't make any change to the home at all. You couldn't put an addition on. You couldn't paint it a different color. You couldn't do anything like that because they were so worried that those changes would detract from the value of the home that when they, do, when they did want to get rid of it, they wouldn't be able to sell those homes. But as soon as people could buy their homes, they expanded them. They put additions on. They changed the interior. They changed the exterior. Because uh, they, they're relatively small. These are pretty small homes, and now they've become much larger. Wait, they couldn't even change like, anything in the it was, you couldn't do anything. Well, you, furniture, you could put a rug in, uh, wow. but you couldn't change the color of the paint wall. There were white walls on the inside. You're not, you were not allowed to change the paint color. That would be insane. It would be tough, yeah. So there's a limitation there. Sydney? Um, I don't know if you would know the answer to this question, but you, we were talking about how it was like a closed community, and I was wondering regarding like the black family, were they treated differently in the, the community versus everybody else? The testimony is really curious on here because they outwardly say we were fine except that, and they gave some examples. And one of the examples was one of the sons in the, in, wanted to be the, the um, drum major for the Hearst High School band. And they wouldn't, they wouldn't, the Hearst High School wouldn't let him do it because they didn't want an African-American man to be leading white women, white girls in the band out onto the community. So they, he couldn't do that. And when they got to be teenagers, they had to drive to dances in Mount Pleasant or other places where they could find African Americans that was really uh, an awkward thing for them in, uh, in Norvelt itself. And not just race. Uh, in the interviews that we had with residents who had grown up there, they said everybody got along, everybody was comfortable with each other. But there were Catholics and Protestants in Norvelt. And that was a big division in the 1930s. And so they said, uh, we could be friends with anybody and that would be fine, but you couldn't date across that religious line. You could, if you're Catholic, you couldn't date a Protestant. If you're Protestant, you couldn't date a Catholic. And people just sort of knew that, that nobody crossed that line. I thought that was interesting as well. Uh, yeah, Joseph. Did they have two different churches like, within the community then? Like, were there, there were a couple Catholic places? churches in Mount Pleasant and nearby. There was no Catholic church within Norvelt. There was eventually the Union Church, Protestant Church built in Norvelt itself. And they did host Norvelt hosted uh, catechism for Catholics, and they hosted Sunday school for Protestants. So you could send your kids in Norvelt somewhere to, to be uh, in, indoctrinated into your faith, but there was no Catholic church right in Norvelt itself. All right, any last questions or comments? Uh,
And I don't know if you guys know when this would be aired or when we could see it. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Lectures in History podcast. If you're interested in hearing more history, check out our podcast, First Ladies, in their own words, using material from C-SPAN's award-winning biography series, First Ladies, and source material from C-SPAN's video library. You'll listen to first spouses addressing issues important to them and the country. The program includes eight modern First Ladies, from Lady Bird Johnson to Melania Trump. First Ladies, in their own words, wherever you get your podcasts.